Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. I am happy to be with you, and I'm hoping that you had a great week and that you are looking forward to a good weekend. I can't believe next week is already Thanksgiving. That's just crazy. November is a busy month in my family for birthdays. My brother-in-law, my aunt, both two of my aunties, actually. My niece, who just turned 17 today, and my husband's birthday was on Monday. So um, lots of birthdays in November. My parents' anniversary is also in November, right around Thanksgiving. And uh, my aunt, my mom, my mom's sister's birthday is also right around Thanksgiving. In fact, they got married the day before her, either her 11th or her 12th birthday. I think it was her 11th birthday. Uh, and she was an adorable not a little bridesmaid. She was very tall. She, um, and so she was only 11, but a very tall bridesmaid, but very cute in the wedding pictures. Anyway, that's what's going on in terms of celebrating around our family. And so, you know, just a busy, a busy month. This was a, a busy week with hubby and niece's birthdays. And then next week, of course, Thanksgiving, auntie's birthday, parents' anniversaries, anniversary that when it's going to be tough, of course, but, uh, we'll get through it. And, um, yeah, of course, Portugal does not celebrate Thanksgiving, so next week is just a regular week here, but uh, it's still in my brain, and I'll be thinking of my family and uh, just going about business. So anyway, let's talk about uh, today's author interview. I am talking with Annette Liebeskin berkowitz about her novel called The Corset Maker. It is historical fiction set during or before, during, and after World War II. Let me go ahead and give you the description of the book. A Parisian count, a Moroccan arms smuggler, and an orphan Spanish boy test the convictions and tug at the heart of Rifka Berg, a young Jewish corsetier from Warsaw. The corset maker follows the enthralling life of Rifka Berg leading up to, during, and after World War II. Born into a pious Orthodox family, Rifka yearns to read forbidden literature and to explore the world beyond the confines of her small community. Her wishes come true, albeit harrowingly, when the tumultuous events of the 20th century take her on a journey for survival. Faced with life and death situations, Rifka must, make, must take immense risks. What decisions will she make? or will circumstances choose for her. The Corset Maker is written in honor of the author's mother and her close friends, all women of immense courage and integrity. Rifka's personal struggles and dilemmas go to the heart of the major ethical issues and challenges of our times. Um, again, that is The Corset Maker. The author is Annette Liebeskin Berkowitz, and it is World War II history, which, uh, uh, historical fiction, which we've We've had a lot of uh, authors come and talk to, um, talk. I've had a lot of authors come and talk to me about their historical fiction set during World War II, and I. It's a period that I enjoy reading about, learning more about. This one is interesting because it's not what you might expect from a World War II historical fiction novel, and we'll get into more of that in the interview. But it takes place um, in areas that you might not read about normally in this type of book. So you've got the Spanish Civil War, you've got Palestine before Israel was even uh, a country, you've got events leading up to World War II in Poland. It is um, it is international in scope. It is fascinating in a lot of ways. It highlights many women as it says it's based partially on the author's mother's life and some of her friends and so parts of it are rooted in 
actual stories of her family and her her mother's friends and family and so there's just a lot of different layers in the book there are a lot of different things that it inspired me to maybe go and look up more more history that I didn't know as much about and um gives you glimpses of some of that history within the pages of this book. So again, the book is called The Corset Maker. Uh, the author is Annette Liebeskin Berkowitz. Let's go ahead now and turn to that interview with Annette. Hello, Annette, and welcome to the podcast. Hello, Sarah. It's nice to be with you today. Thank you for joining me. Um, I'm excited to talk about your historical fiction novel called The Corset Maker. Before we do that, though, um, if you would just take a moment and share a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Oh, my goodness. I hope you have a long moment, <laughs> but I, I'll try to be brief. Um, uh, since 2006, which is like quite a long time, uh, I've been writing uh, I'm an author, I'm a poet, uh, but prior to that, I had a whole other life. I spent uh, uh, over 30 years in the field of wildlife conservation uh, with my office headquartered at what some people say, the world famous Bronx Zoo in New York. So I worked with wildlife, both on site at the Bronx Zoo and uh, around the world. Uh, so uh, when I retired, which I did at my husband's urging, he kept saying, you've always wanted to write, you've got to retire so you could finally start. So I did, and I've been writing ever since, and writing makes, makes me very happy, and uh, I hope to be doing it for many more years. Yeah. Well, that's that's wonderful that you had a supportive partner who you know encouraged you and and that you you had the time and and the inclination. Yes, and, and it's something I should say, Sarah, that my yearning for writing, I think it's something I inherited from my mother, who is the inspiration for this historical novel that we will talk about in a moment. But she was a writer ever since she was a young girl. And it was very unusual because she grew up in a strictly Jewish Orthodox home in pre-World War II Warsaw, Poland. Uh, this was not a thing that girls did. Uh, but she, by the time she became uh, about 14 or 15, she submitted a story to a contest uh, that was uh, conducted in Warsaw by a very famous uh, uh, Polish educator and physician, Janusz Korczak. And she won that year's uh, contest. Uh, you'll see when we talk about the novel, her life was such that she really couldn't uh, pick up on, on her passion for writing uh, until uh, she came to the United States. And then she only wanted to write in English, which was difficult because she didn't know English. Sure. So she studied it. So that's yeah. the brief story. No, you and you mentioned that in the foreword of the book. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because I thought that was uh, amazing for your for your mother to pursue that. And especially in the time frame, you know, and, and as a female, and I'm really, I was really amazed that she did that. Yes, she was, yeah. she was a very amazing person. That's wonderful. So the book is historical fiction, but it is based on some events in your mother's life. Can you give an overview of the story? Yes. Uh, in brief, uh, the story is about friendship between two young Jewish women in pre-World War II Warsaw, Poland, and what happens to their friendship when anti-Semitism, wars, and men interfere. So it is about how major world events impact individual relationships. But that's just uh, maybe the tip of the iceberg, if I could put it that way. It's about more. It's about women's role in society, 
It's about making impulsive decisions in one's youth that can alter the course of an entire life. It's about violence. And it's about motherhood. It's about different kinds of love, the love of a friend, the love of a partner, and the love of a child. Uh, and and uh, that's, that's sort of in brief, and these strands run through the, the entire story. You, you mm. said something, Sarah, uh, a moment ago about uh, inspired by my mother, and, and I wanted to... Uh, say something about uh, these t terms such as inspired by and based on, because I see when I see, uh, for example, uh, programs promoted on, on the streaming services, Netflix, etc., they would use the word based on or inspired by, and, and they throw them around very loosely, but I want to explain them in the context of my book. To me, based on is something that's the literal truth. It's not a writer's invention. And inspired by, it, it's more general ideas and themes and questions that are uh, based on a person who may have articulated them. But that's not the literal um, series of events that happen to the protagonist, though the historical facts are true. So in the case of my book, uh, my story is actually a hybrid of both. The first third of the book or so is uh, inspired, is based on my mother, and the rest is inspired by my mother. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and one thing that I really uh, enjoyed, I mean, I, I enjoyed a lot of things about this book, but it is set during World War II, and there's a lot of books, historical fiction and otherwise right now, that are set during this time frame, but you really get a different picture of World War II through the eyes of the characters of this book, because it takes place in multiple countries. It takes place, you're seeing not only World War II, but some of the events that were leading up to it and surrounding it that maybe people aren't as familiar with. Can you talk a little bit more about the events that you chose to portray that weren't necessarily um, based on your mother's experience? Yes, I would, I would like that because uh, in my research, it it struck me that um, when we think about uh, World War II, uh, we think about it as a sort of a singular event, and in many ways it was. But what we don't think about, I certainly didn't think about it until I did my research for this novel, is about the Spanish Civil War. Now, what does the Spanish Civil War have to do with World War II? Well, very few people realize that it was a practice run by the Nazis for World War II. Uh, and, and what resonates with me, especially at this time, about the Spanish Civil War is the parallels that has to the war in Ukraine. Uh, the, the Spanish Civil War attracted uh, somewhere between 40 and 60,000 volunteers from 50 countries around the world uh, to, to join the international brigades and to fight in that war. Why? Because a democratically elected government uh, was uh, in, in, in peril. And, and so uh, uh, especially young people who were idealistic about democracy and freedom uh, flocked uh, to Spain uh, and uh, it, it, the, the kinds of people uh, that came to the international brigades really, I think, highlight how, how it touched the hearts of so many people around the world because very famous people in the arts uh, took part in this war. Uh, Garcia Lorca, the poet that was assassinated, Ernest Hemingway, um, Pablo Neruda, uh, Langston Hughes, Lillian Hellman, uh, George Orwell, and on and on. I, I could go on with the list. Uh, but uh, the Spanish Civil War uh, was a s systemic killing and torture 
uh, with the involvement of Germany and uh, Italy, which was controlled by uh, uh, Nazi, who uh, was uh, Mussolini, uh, half a million people fled to France during that war. It was a tremendous disruption, and 200,000 people were killed. So few people think of the Spanish a civil war at all. But I met my mother's friend, my mother's friend, Ruth, who was um, a member of the International Brigades. She was a young Jewish woman from Poland who went to volunteer uh, in Spain. And eventually after the war, she came home with a Spaniard for a husband and, and her participation in it always fascinated me greatly. I mean, the thought that this young Jewish woman, my mother's age, uh, ended up fighting in that war just just fascinated me. So that became a part of the overall story because my thought was, if my mother hadn't gone to Palestine, would she have gone to fight in Spain? I think she would have, knowing her personality. Uh, but her friend Ruth did, so then she became incorporated into the story. Time to take our first break of the podcast, but you can see a little bit of what I was referencing before we started the interview about the Spanish Civil War and maybe some situations that are new to you, or maybe they're not new to you, but uh, you might learn something a little bit different about events in history. I uh, We're going to talk a little bit more about this when we come back, so stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking with author Annette Leviskin berkowitz about her historical fiction novel, uh, somewhat based on her mother's life, inspired by her mother's life. Again, the book is called The Corset Maker. Let's return to the interview. As a reminder, before the break, we were talking about the section of the book that takes place during the Spanish Civil War. Yeah, I knew a little bit about the Spanish Civil War, but not to the extent that I, I didn't realize how many volunteers from so many different countries actually went. Yes, and that's what, uh, you know, these are echoes of, uh, as uh, who said it, I don't remember who coined this phrase that history may not repeat itself, but it rhymes. Mm. And well, that, that's exactly what's uh, what's happened in Ukraine. Uh uh, terrible atrocities are being committed. People are displaced for their, from their homes. Lives are being disrupted. And volunteers from all over the world uh, are coming to, to help the Ukrainians. So, uh, you know, th that phrase of uh, we have to remember history or else we are doomed to repeat it mm -hmm. is very applicable. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit more about the main character in the book. She's a uh, her birth name is Rivka, but she goes yes. through a couple of different identities as things transpire. But can you talk about her a little bit more? And uh, what about her character might resonate with readers? Uh, well, Rivka is um, Rivka is an idealist. She starts out life going to a school, which is which is very unusual for the time period. It's a school uh, where young girls uh, learn history world history, which wasn't common at the time. People don't don't realize that. Uh, and she, uh, even though the book is certainly not aligned with any political ideology, uh, Rivka is exposed to big questions of morality in her humanist uh, gymnasium uh, in Poland, 
So she embraces pacifism uh, with a passion. She is staunchly anti-war. She doesn't want to hear of fighting. She feels that humans should settle their arguments in a civilized way. And, and, and she is for women's rights. She comes under enormous pressure from her Orthodox family to uh, to marry. And uh, her parents uh, try to repeatedly arrange a marriage. She doesn't want that kind of a life. Uh, she dreams of the arts. And uh, when she takes up her profession, but she becomes a, a corset maker and a brassiere maker, she sees herself more as a sculptor. Uh, as she sees herself as an artist. And that's the kind of life she wants to pursue. But then, of course, things happen. I should, I should have noted at the beginning that Rivka recruits her best friend, uh, Branka, uh to uh be her partner in the shop and and going back to what i said about based on and inspired by well this is really based on my mother my mother did open a shop at age 17 on warsaw's main street uh main street is marshalkovska it's a it's a beautiful street it's like the fifth avenue uh, of warsaw and i should note here for your listeners uh, people who are not familiar with Poland, a pre-war Warsaw was considered the Paris of the East. It was cosmopolitan, was vibrant, was beautiful. Uh, it, it was culturally very rich. Uh, so uh, for a young girl coming from an Orthodox home, uh, which both Rivka and my mother uh, uh, came from, to open a shop on that street has requires a tremendous amount of, uh, what can I call it, chutzpah. <laughs> uh, and and she recruited uh, a friend named Branka, and my mother, in fact, had a friend, Branka, and the two of them did very well with their shop. But then, um, uh, well, the, the, well, the book talks about the anti-Semitic riots, uh, which, which caused... Uh, a rift in in their relationship and then something else happened i, I don't want to give away the story but uh rifka needs to find her sister who is a, a pioneer settling uh palestine and and she goes off uh via paris to palestine which is something once again based on my mother my mother did just that I think one thing I really appreciated about the book is how many different viewpoints, not only viewpoints, but but different um, points in history that you get, because this is pre-World War II. Israel doesn't exist yet. Um, and so for people who maybe aren't familiar, as familiar with the history of Palestine and then Israel becoming a country, getting those, those little snapshots of um, settling in Palestine and what that entails. I, I thought was um, it, it really maybe could open readers' eyes to something that they then want to read more about. Yes, I've heard from uh, a good number of readers who have told me they appreciated uh, the story being set in all these different uh, parts of the world, uh, parts of the world they may not have been familiar with uh, for Palestine, for one. And, and even people who have been to modern day in Israel haven't experienced anything like I described in the story. Because what I described in the story is, is the pre-Israel uh, Palestine. And, and I know uh, a good deal about it, not just from research, but uh, from uh, my mother's sisters. Uh, two of my mother's sisters, in fact, went to Palestine uh, a long time before World War II, and they settled uh, areas, and, and I know about the conditions there. So I was able to describe it both from research and firsthand experience. And Spain, I also did a lot of research. I had one reader give me the ultimate compliment. She said, 
I, I love the descriptions of those places because you, you must have been to all of those places. And the fact of the matter is that I haven't been to all those places. Uh, I would like to go to them, but I researched them uh, to to a great degree of detail, which, which is a part of writing a, a historical novel. Oh, absolutely. But, <laughs> Sarah, I thought I would say uh, something... Uh, more about uh, the both the male, uh, the female and male characters in the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, Rivka, as we said, Rivka is very uh, strong-willed, very idealistic. Um, uh, she she refuses to take no for an answer. Brunka, her friend, on the other hand, is a very different personality. Uh, she is very easygoing. Uh, and she's very easily swayed, but she's a very loyal friend uh, to, to Rivka. Uh, some of the other women in the story, uh, I try to put in interesting women, strong women, which is the kind of women that appeals to me. So there we find a Senora Fuentes. You probably remember she's the proprietor of the rental apartment house in Albacete, Spain, mm-hmm. where the international head, uh, brigades were headquartered. There is uh, Madame Trevers, who who basically uh, is, is a big factor in Rivka's survival. She manages the Hotel Continental in Pau, France. And by the way, the Hotel Continental is not my invention as an author. It's an actual hotel where they, the kinds of events I described actually happened. Uh, there is Mrs. Rubenstein and her young daughter, Ida. A lot of people remember Ida from the book. And there is Cecile Duval, who is the sister of the owner of the most famous couture house uh, in Paris. Uh, so these are the women, and uh, so uh, they were inspired by a lot of strong women I know. <laughs> but somebody asked me, "Oh, what about men in your novel? Who who inspired them?" And I said, "No, th- these happen to be entirely my inventions, uh, and I invented them specifically to provide Rivka with challenges about." things such as sexuality, about deciding what love is. Uh, So that if your listeners have got an idea that this is only a book about wars and violence, there is a lot more. It has layers and there is relationship between female friends and about men and women. So as far as the men, readers meet Alexander, who is a French count, he is a sculptor from Paris whose mother uh, is Jewish and whose father was a Polish count. Uh, there is Jacob Ben Maimon, who is the Jewish Moroccan arms dealer or smuggler. Uh, and there is Uri, the Haganah commander. And finally, there is Jean Petit. He's the Parisian fashion photographer who, as I said in my description, is anything but petite. Uh, Mm -hmm. There is Father Chappelle, and there is the Oberst Gruppenführer Krauss, and Monsieur Bonheur, whose name uh, becomes attached to Rivka later on in her history. He's a French farmer. So that's uh, about the character. I'm going to jump in here so we can take our second break of the podcast when we come back. And that will be speaking a little bit more um, about why she wrote the book. She's alluded to um, some of it, but she wants to go further. She'll be going further into that subject. And we'll also be talking about some of the anti-Semitism that is existing in today's world, unfortunately. So um, stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. The vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. 
From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Annette liebeskin Berkovitz. We are speaking about her historical fiction novel, The Corset Maker. There there are two different things I want to say. One is, uh, I I want to say a little something about why I wrote this book, uh, in addition to wanting to give tribute to my mother and her friends uh, for playing such an important part of of this uh, 20th century history. Today, uh, we are some 70 years after the Holocaust. Uh, Anti-Semitism is again being expressed very violently and publicly. And classic anti-Semitic tropes are expressed very freely. Uh, uh, They don't arise the kind of shock and surprise they would have in the past. and Jews have been attacked, murdered both in Europe and in this country. Uh, so uh, uh, following the decades uh, after the Holocaust, uh, anti-Semitism really avoided in public, uh, but it remained prominent and private. And now it's becoming expressed more and more overtly. And as a daughter of survivors, uh, I felt responsible to show via this uh anti-fascist novel, um, the history, and that it, fascism needs to be understood in a context, and I embedded it in the context of my book. Uh, the other thing that I hope you'll let me talk about a little bit, uh, Sarah, is about my mother, who was, in fact, the real corset maker, as I said, who started her shop in Warsaw at age 17 with her friend Branka. And um, after the war, she continued her corset and brassiere business in post-war, which uh, readers might find, uh, okay, fine, that's interesting, but what's so special about it? Well, what's so special about it is is that post-war Poland was communist and private businesses were not welcome by the government. Any private uh, business uh, owner was harassed by government uh, tax authorities, but a business run by a woman was doubly uh, under threat from uh, officials. And so uh, running that shop in post-war Poland was quite remarkable. Uh, My mother was fortunate in that a couple of blocks from her shop was the largest theater in in Wood, uh, because that's where we lived uh, post-war. And uh, the actresses in the theater, uh, many of them, if not most of them, became my mother's clients. Now, why would that be the case? Well, imagine... uh, Post-war Poland, young people now cannot fathom this. There wasn't a store where you could go in and just buy a bra. There was no such thing. You had to go uh, and be measured for it and have uh, a corsetier make it for you. But my mother might have been, if not the only one, one of a tiny handful in post-war Poland in Łódź where you could get a bra made. Now, if you're an actress in the theater, you really care about your appearance. So uh, my mother was uh, very busy and she had a very thriving business. But what surprised me the most about it, and your readers might be surprised by this, 
uh, in, in the late 90s, uh, I went back to Poland with my father, and he wanted to see the store that uh, was my mother's shop. So we browsed to the store, which is now a, a tiny, very elegant hat boutique. And and the owner of it no, noticed me sort of looking around, not just uh, at the merchandise, but at the place. And she said, you know, th- I want to share with you a little bit of interesting history of my shop. She said about 50 years ago, there was a very famous corsetier who had a shop here, and people still talk about how amazing she was. And I said, that was my mother. And this woman was just totally flabbergasted that she was shocked. But my mother's uh, uh, corsets and brassieres were so fantastic that people talked about them decades later. So there's another reason uh, why she inspired me. But I should tell you now, if you give me the chance, Sarah, about another book that came of mine that came out this year, where readers who are interested could meet not only the young me, but the real corsetier, my mother. And the book is a memoir that came out just this September called Aftermath, Coming of Age on Three Continents, because, in fact, they came of age on three continents. And my mother is very much uh, a part of the book. So uh, for some readers, it will be very interesting to read the novel and then read uh, Aftermath, Coming of Age on Three Continents, where they can meet the actual woman who inspired the novel. And how different was it to write the the memoir versus the historical fiction? I know if I'm remembering correctly, at at the beginning of the book, you talk about um, that your your mother understandably didn't like to talk about a lot of events in her life. So how did you kind of fill in those gaps for the memoir? (laughs) Well, uh, I, I should clarify, Aftermath is is my memoir. So it's it's about me, but of course my mother is very much a part of me. Uh, so there are stories about her in the book, uh, and and it's my mother as I remember them as a young girl. Uh, y- you are correct in saying that there was a lot about my mother that I didn't know, and I sort of filled in the blanks uh, by writing a novel. That's why I wrote uh, The Corset Maker, because the parts of her that I didn't know, I had the liberty of inventing in The Corset Maker. Uh, The person in my family who really talked a lot about their history and the the history of uh, Polish Jews was my father. And he... uh, was the inspiration for my very first memoir called In the Unlikeliest of Places. Uh, and um, that that memoir also has parts of my mother, but that memoir is basically focused on my father and on my relationship to him as an adult daughter. So Aftermath is very different. I've now written three memoirs And they're all very different. The first one, as I say, is the one inspired by my father. It's not inspired on, it's based on. Let me use my terms correctly. Uh, The unlikeliest of places is entirely based on my father's life. And um, me as an adult daughter reacting to some of his attitudes and relationships uh, to Poland, a place where almost his entire family was exterminated. Uh, My second memoir is called Confessions of an Accidental Zoo Curator, which is a memoir of my professional life at the Bronx Zoo of 30 years plus, as I said. 
and uh, I encountered not only strange animals, but strange people uh, and their relationship to animals. So I wrote a series of stories uh, that a lot of people find uh, entertaining and humorous, but there is a serious undercurrent in all the stories that that uh, really speaks to the need to conserve uh, wildlife uh, uh, around the world. And my f- uh, third memoir is the one that was just released that I've been speaking about, Aftermath, uh, Coming of Age on Three Continents. That's a story of me growing up, born at the foothills of the Himalayas in Kyrgyzstan, uh, returning uh, as a young girl to Poland with my parents who wanted to find their families. Uh, they had escaped uh, uh, the Nazi onslaught and they were imprisoned in Soviet gulags. And so I grew up uh, my elementary school years in Łódź, Poland. And um uh, the first opportunity, my parents had to leave because you couldn't just pick up and leave a communist country. You had to wait for permission, which was very difficult to obtain. Uh, I uh, arrived in Israel at age 13, not speaking a, a word of the Hebrew language. And uh, two years later, as I say, I was yanked out by my roots And at age 16, I arrived in New York City again, not knowing a word of English. So that that kind of sums up a big story in a few words. Yeah, that's um, that's a lot. (laughs) And and then how? I mean, obviously, you've you've been speaking English for for quite a while since you've been here, been since 16. But then. did you ever have any issues writing it or did that did did knowing multiple languages come in handy or did you find it difficult when it comes to writing? I think that knowing uh, the more languages, you know, the easier language becomes. But I also think uh, it has to do with uh, your exposure to multiple languages as, as a young child, or even as an infant. Uh as a, as a, as an infant, uh, I was exposed to uh, Polish, uh, Russian, and Yiddish, which is more of a Germanic language. Uh, Russian and Polish are very different, but they are uh, Slavic languages. And I think the combination of different sounds has has made it easier for me to learn a language. Uh, I I won't explain how, because that's the whole fun part of reading uh, my last memoir, is how, without knowing a word of English, I managed to get into what was then in 19, uh, 1960, the, the, it was recognized as the best public high school in the United States, the Bronx High School of Science. It's a school that required a special entrance exam to get in. I'm the only student, I was told, uh, by the principals of the school to have ever been admitted to that school without knowing a word of English and without taking the entrance exam. But how they came about, I can't say because that's that's something readers have to find out from reading the book. Um, so uh, a, a language has never been difficult for me. I have, I have a good ear for it, I think. Uh, I think my daughter inherited that capability. She's fluent in in Italian. She lives there right now. Uh, But I did not pass it on to my son. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure he has other skills. (laughs) Time for our final break of the podcast. But when we return, we'll be talking about the cover of the book and the role that Annette's brother had in designing it. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. 
Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking with Annette leviskin Berkovitz. Before the break, she was talking about language skills and um, the language skills that her daughter has and talking about her children a little bit. So I'm just reminding you of what we were speaking about so that my next comment about siblings is in a little bit more context. So let's go ahead and return to that interview. Yes. Um, speaking of, of siblings, I wanted to mention your brother as well, because he um, designed the cover of the book, right? Yes, my brother is a very, very interesting person. Uh, he, I call him my little brother. He's two years younger than I am. Uh, but he is he may be small in stature, but he's a giant in his field. He is mm-hmm. the, architect, the architect, Daniel Liebeskind. He's built some of the most famous museums around the world. I think the most famous uh, could be the Jewish Museum in Berlin, which is the most visited museum in Germany. Um, he is, uh, I think he's got a, a museum uh, or famous uh, public building in on every continent. Uh, probably in every country in Europe and in the U.S. Right now, he's working on um, uh, rebuilding the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, where so many worshipers were killed. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, But that's one of his many projects with range. He has got incredible range in his creativity. Uh, And people who come to New York at Christmas to see the Rockefeller Christmas tree and look at that amazing star at the top that's designed by Daniel. Uh, He has directed operas and done stage sets and costumes and the musical direction. So he is an artist in many fields. And I feel very, very fortunate that he designed the cover uh, for the corset maker. Uh, I'm very, very happy. It's it's sort of his typical enigmatic style, uh, which I love. A lot of people ask, uh, ask me uh, what some of the elements on it are, but uh, without reading the book, I, I, I can't really disclose it. But I would talk, if you give me another moment, about the cover, just for a minute. Absolutely. Uh, yep. Okay. The cover, some uh, people have expressed uh, the concern that there's a swastika on the cover. Uh, now, uh, I, I want uh, potential readers to understand it in context. Uh, there is the majority of young people today don't really understand how the swastika was used by the Nazis. And and people looking at this cover uh, should understand that this is not Hitler's swastika. Hitler issued a very specific decree that the swastika had to be in black on a red background. Um, On my cover, it's white on a gray background. And it's small and it's not prominent on the cover. It kind of fades into the background because that's exactly the hope uh, that I have readers will understand it uh, disappearing after reading the book or the hope that it will disappear. 
Um, so so uh, that's a note I wanted to make about the cover. I also want to make a comment about the prologue of the book. <laughs> my husband, who who is my my muse and my inspiration, uh, was the first reader of my first draft, and he said, "Why did you put such an important chapter as a prologue?" He said, "Why don't you call it Chapter One?" And I said, "Well, it's not Chapter One; it's the prologue because I like the idea of having a prologue and an epilogue. It's the kind of bookends for the story. I like it." He said, well, I think a lot of people don't real, read prologues and they would skip it. And and I, I said to him, that's not true. Everybody reads a prologue. Well, then I had Unfortunately, somebody. Unfortunately, he's right. <laughs> I, had somebody, I had somebody else read the book and they said, I asked this question and she said, oh, I always skip the prologue. I said, oh, my God. Well, I want your listeners to know that w- the prologue to this particular story is essential to understanding the story and the personality and the character of the protagonist. If you skip mm-hmm. the story, you won't really understand it the way I was hoping my readers would understand it. Mm-hmm. So. I I didn't know that people skipped prologues either until actually somebody that I interviewed a few years ago uh, tweeted one day that she never reads prologues. And I was like, Wow, but you miss so much sometimes. Yes, yes. I I never skipped them, so I didn't imagine people did. But people, readers do what they will do. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, I, I wanted to to say uh, uh, for any listeners out there who are interested in the corset maker or aftermath, uh, coming of age on three continents. Uh, there is a lot more information about those two books and about my other books on my website, which is simply my name, AnnetteBerkowitz.com. And there is a lot there for book clubs. There is reading There is reading guides and questions. And uh, what else? I'm available for reading clubs. I've met with some reading clubs already um, on Zoom. There was an international reading club uh, organized by a woman in Westchester County, New York. She she brought together readers from, I think she had six countries, and they were able to ask me questions and clarify things that they read about, and I enjoyed it enormously. So uh, that's always a possibility now with Zoom being in such wide use. All right. Uh, website, any um, social media or anything that people can find you on? Uh, well, I am on Facebook under Annette Liebeskin Berkowitz, author. I've reclaimed my maiden name, Liebeskin, uh, because I, I guess uh, I was married way back in the dark ages when <laughs> women took their husband's name. Yes. I don't know if I'll be doing that now. Uh uh, so um, my author name is Annette Liebeskin Berkowitz, but my website is just to, for simplicity, AnnetteBerkowitz.com. Makes sense. Um, yeah, for people to type, that that is much easier for them. Order, yes. Yes. Annette, is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to mention before our time is up? Uh, I think you had asked me at some point books that I read. I would just say, uh, I'll mention one book that I just finished reading because I was very moved by it. It's a, a book of stories called uh, Oedipus in Brooklyn and other stories by an author called Bluma Lempel, B-L-U-M-E-L-E-M-P-E-L, uh, and what would uh, it's the most beautiful evocative writing uh, uh, and it's, it's writing uh, mostly about uh, difficult subjects and and some of them are tragedies but it's expressed in such a poetic way that I, I'm just uh, in love with this author and and I'm I'm delighted to say that she has been, resurrected from the bin of history. Uh, She wrote 
in Yiddish, um, which um, is not widely known. There, there were a lot of uh, well-known Yiddish authors, uh, the most famous of whom is um, Isaac Beshevis Singer, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature. But there were a lot of women writing at that same period in the in the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s, fabulous writers whose whose writings uh, perished w- with the Nazis, but some survived, and uh, they're being translated into English now. So this is an English version of a Yiddish book called Oedipus in Brooklyn and other stories and. I was extremely moved by it, so I wanted to mention it. All right. Well, thank you so much. And thank you um, for taking the time to talk to me, not only about The Corset Maker, but also some of your memoirs. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you again to Annette for joining me to talk about this book. You know that I love historical fiction, and I am definitely fascinated by World War II historical fiction. I've had other authors on the podcast with this era of historical fiction, and it's always fascinating to me just how broad the scope. I mean, it literally was, of course, a world war, and so just the number of different experiences and countries and places that are involved in this war that was so devastating and so global. Um, But I really enjoyed the fact that this is a tribute to her mother and some of her mother's very strong female friends. I I really liked that aspect of it. I enjoyed that it took me to places that I might not have thought as much about during this time period. Again, the Spanish Civil War, learning more about Palestine before Israel was a country. Um, I learned a lot about that uh, in grad school, but it is such a complex history of that area. It is, um, it's just continually changing and it's so complicated if going back thousands of years. So just getting that glimpse of the people that went there before Israel was a country and how those tensions were already there, of course, and then how you can see now some of the, the tensions that are still in existence, but Um, Just so many different layers of this novel that I appreciated, and hopefully one of these days soon I'm going to get a chance to read the, um, well, actually all three of her memoirs sound fascinating, but since I've read The Course Maker, I think next I want to read the one that gives a little bit more information about her her mother's life, but also her own life sounds fascinating, doesn't it? She just sounds like such a fascinating woman, and... um, the language skills, the the going different places and having to just start over in terms of language. I am uh, in awe because I am struggling to learn a new language right now and it is not going well. But um, yeah, just a fascinating life and so many different things. This, this podcast, of course, could have been, this episode could have been hours long because I could have just... Um, gone down rabbit holes of questions of her life and her parents' life and her brother's life and her, I mean, just so many different different avenues, her life, of course, as well. So, Annette, thank you for joining me for this interview. Uh, I hope that you, the readers, who I adore and appreciate uh, so much, hope you know that. I know I say it every episode because it is absolutely true, but I hope you will join me for the next episode. We're shifting gears from historical fiction to psychological um, thriller suspense. It is a book called Sinkhole. The author is Davida G. Breyer, set in the 80s in Florida. So kind of historical fiction, but a different type. <laughs> Definitely a different a different era and a different period. So join me for that interview. In the meantime, if you are a fan of this podcast, as always, please like, subscribe, follow on whatever platform you listen on. That way you can always know when there are new episodes. And also um, a review is really, really helpful. Review the books you read. Also review the podcasts that you listen to. It just It's helpful for us who are behind the scenes working on those things. Um, a starred or written review is great and very helpful to the podcast. Uh, also, follow on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Love, love, love hearing from you. Hope you're having 
the beginning of a fantastic weekend. Um, or if you're listening to this in the middle of your fantastic weekend, or maybe you're listening to it next week. I don't know. But if you're getting ready for Thanksgiving, hope those preparations are going well. If you don't live somewhere where next week is Thanksgiving, I hope you just have a fabulous week. But As always, as you already know, I hope that whatever your week brings you, it brings you plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book or many good books. Thanks. Talk to you next time. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from Moo to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program